Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan Hussey with Zaner Ag Hedge, bringing you our strategy of the week update here for April 6th, 2023. Before we begin, remember trading futures involves risk and is not suitable for all investors. And everything I talk about here today is just my own opinion and not a direct trade recommendation. And if you're joining us on Facebook, uh, do feel free to sign up for our Zaner Daily Newsletter or our this uh, or this strategy of the week webinar uh, to receive the email updates and of course the video recording of it here every week um, so that you're not missing more than what you just get from the strategy of the day here on Facebook. But what a week it was uh, for financial futures and markets in general. The commodities um, were fairly mixed. Um, you saw, I think, pairing back of some gains we saw from last week um, in this shortened week here. I'm kind of speaking more towards the row crops than anything else here, uh, I guess, because uh, that's really been where my focus has been um, more or less this last week. I think there's developments going on in the cattle and in other places, but the price action in the last couple of days kind of left me sitting on the sidelines waiting for maybe a little bit more of a pullback to get back in or to you know position in some places. But we'll, we'll talk more about like my thoughts there as we go through uh, today. Um, and I actually want to begin with kind of our macro stuff because we, we tend to be, I don't know about you guys and, and, and anyone out there, but we tend to sometimes hyper-focus on some of the markets that we're really trying to catch, uh, you know, and get a feel for. In this case, you know, corn, wheat, and beans this time of year, we're at the start of uh, our growing se season, um, we're working on trying to get a feel for the market for, you know, price action going into the plant now and, and you know, how weather can affect that. But we're trying to set a benchmark for ourselves for pricing this next year. And, um, you know, because many of my clients are row crop and, and hedge, uh, you know, field crop hedging oriented. Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't work with other commodities, right? It's just that's my primary focus and, and main um main uh, customer base and clients that I work with, right? Uh, that's what they do for a living. And that's the risk that we're constantly looking to try to help um, manage. All right. So the macros, crude oil um, caught everyone's attention last week, right? Saudis uh, announced a major price or a major production cut um, over the weekend that, you know, causes the, uh, the crude market to gap up. Uh, above, uh, you know, the, the highs here and run up into basically, you know, resistance. If we're looking at a continuation chart here of the W2 uh, and crude chart uh, going, you know, way back in time here, the six, you know, 50 lows from pandemic uh, all the way up to uh, the 129 highs of the hyperinflation uh, market that we saw, you know, post pandemic. Uh, we basically pulled back into a 50% retracement in the 60 area, which is also kind of a retest of this old breakout area uh, between, you know, 66 to 85, that was an area of congestion in the market that we chewed through and finally broke out of. Now the market's come back, right, to test that area. And we're kind of chewing through it uh, to the downside as well. I feel that it's now more support than anything else, um, given kind of the downward sloping channel nature of this downtrend in crude. Uh, it doesn't, I mean, it of course could be a long-term top, but I think in the near term and some of the short-term price cycles we're seeing, there is a reason, you know, we, I feel we will test back to 90 and potentially even hundred dollars a barrel. <clears throat> okay. Um, anyway, we gapped up on the week. We've been bull flagging inside of a, um, inside of sideways price action here at or near highs, uh, really, you know, between the 79 and 82 figure, um, the last couple of days worth of price action, even though, yes, we made a new minor high and maybe even a minor low here intraday, uh, this feels like just inside price action to me. You give it, give crude a couple of ticks on either side of the market. It likes to trade both sides of the book and, and cause both sides to believe they're right by, you know, little minuscule um, push throughs. But one thing I will say about crude is if you look where we, we are settling or, or looking to close here on the week, it is up basically, you know, at or near the high end of the old range and certainly above most, if not all of the downward sloping trend lines that you can draw on the chart. And now that if we're basically, this is market gapping up and moving above those, 
where's the next area of resistance, right? Well, okay, that's clearing through this, you know, cluster of highs here around the 82 to 83 area. There's not much in terms on the chart back to 90 to 93. And then above that, I mean, you're talking this old $100 very psychological level, uh, the downward sloping trend off the highs. And, and again, you know, you're back up to old contract highs at that point, uh, or the near-term highs at that point at 129. And maybe even new all-time highs. Let's not fast forward ourselves, you know, get ahead of ourselves too much. We're still at, you know, below the 82 to 83 dollar area that we need to break through the market to continue higher. But I think that today, uh, or the uh, end of price action today, barring any crazy this in the last three hours, which very doubtful we would see a major sell-off in the crude oil right now, uh, given how bullish it's remained. Uh, I think we might be surprised next week as to how bullish this can get if this whole week the the, the shorts couldn't reverse this uptrend couldn't fill the gap. I mean, bull markets don't fill gaps and we will be watching for this gap. Uh, you know, let's, my rules kind of state, I need to put a little price uh, level there to be mindful of this. Uh, uh, to remember that there is an open gap here. Um, I always mark these on the charts because, you know, in, in futures gaps, in, in my opinion, are, um, one of the more important or you know action oriented levels you can talk about whether it means you take a trade there or you're just aware that it's there and we're running away from it um it, it helps tells tell uh, tells us something right and be mindful of it because gaps typically fill on a long enough time frame so very bullish looking crude chart right now and the way we're closing this week I really, I mean, there's really no other way that I can describe it. Again, it really gets bullish with that break above the highs here. And I'm not saying it is a dead set trade, but, you know, uh, buying 82 or $83 calls seems seems like a good uh, value, you know, proposition to have finite risk on a trade that, you know, bets on a move like that. Uh, but I also think maybe even just buying the breakout of those highs might you know, be fruitful with stops below 79 or something. So we'll see what happens into early next week. Uh, but I think a push through that 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 area is, is coming. Um, gold and silver, uh, you know, generally, you know, have been stronger here uh, to start off April. Uh, gold, you know, breaking through downward sloping trend lines. You know, if you took from that March top uh, through the February, uh, you know, top, we had basically the end of March consolidation uh, in a bull pennant or bull flag above that, and now the beginning of April has been that push through. You know, there are definitely concerns because, okay, this type of price action, right, it could be indicative of this one little push through is a top in the short term and a move back down to 1950 can't be ruled off the table. But I do think, a, you know, while we're above 1950 to 1968, 1970, 1950 is kind of just a arbitrary uh, level. But, um, you know, the real lows here are the 1966 lows for the month of April and 19... Um, uh, 74 highs for the month of February that I believe are kind of the inflection zone right now that we are bullish above, bearish below uh, in the near term for gold. Uh, this also, right, while we're above that area, it continues to put pressure on the old highs here at 2089 uh, and then, of course, the highs from March. And above those levels, right, where does the door open to? Where, do, where are some fib extensions? How high can we go? You know, 22... Uh, 97 is, is called the 2300 levels, my, my first target. And I think, you know, really gold has the potential to, you know, extend towards 26 to 2700 here, um, but it's not going to go there in a straight line. Um, there's going to be a little bit up and down, uh, but I do think we are signaling breaks above resistance, right? Markets always come back to test some kind of support before continuing higher. But um, yeah, while you step back and price action since you know, 2020 has generally been in the 1600 to 2000 range. You do have to, you know, sober yourself and realize, okay, maybe we are in that range still. Um, but if there's ever an opportunity to break out of it, right, these these movements, while we still have green, green candles and, you know, two days or a day and a half down off the highs does not a trend reversal, you know, make just yet. Um, while we're still putting pressure on resistance, we can still... Uh, continue to monitor this, you know, that kind of situation and assume that the trend is potentially still heading higher until it's not. That doesn't mean we don't trail stops. Again, we get below 1965, things could change if we fall back into the old range. 
then we're signaling maybe you know this larger range is in play and we could be coming back down. But there's other markets that are correlated with gold, like the 30-year note um, and, and the bonds that we can you know kind of look for. And in this last swing uh, higher, you know, the 30-year moved from the 122 handle now pushing to the 134 handle. That's above that 132 area. That similar, I guess, you know, you could say this 132 to 134 area in the bonds is is, is a break. Is similar to 2000 in the gold. So, you know, what does it take now to get gold to 2300 to 2700? Well, I do think the bonds are going to have to rally to 145 to 154. Um, and certainly it doesn't have to because gold has been a lot more bullish than the bonds have in this last cycle since last November. Um, you know, they've actually headed back to highs and levels that we are at in 2021 and 2022. The bonds are simply retracing and only, you know, still within 25% of the lows of that whole trend. So it's a little bit different. Uh, I would say the the waves of, you know, positive and negative forces on these charts happen to be in the same direction at the same time. But the, you know, uh, the power at which they move. In other words, right now, it's hard for gold to move up when the bonds have a down day and vice versa. But it doesn't mean that gold can't be up $50 and the bonds only up half a point on the day, right, is, is I guess what I'm getting at, is that the um, magnitude of the trends and how they affect the two uh, seems to shift on and off, right? But generally speaking, uh, more times than not, I find that they have that, you know, at least some kind of directional um, correlation at, at times, right? Um, more so than really a tangible analog you can roll over, you know, mark on a chart. But it's all relative because markets and you know debt cycles reset you know some point five thousand dollars in gold is going to be a bottom line for gold right where would you know that might be 40 50 years down the road right like my kids may see five thousand and ten thousand dollar gold uh, just based off of you know another 20 years of 30 years of inflation right um that cycles will have reset and changed and bonds won't be trading at the same prices right so this is how those things readjust in my opinion on the macro sense and we're seeing that because the u.s has for the first time in a decade really started to shift its financial policy from basically quantitative easing into quantitative tightening um with it with, with finally raising interest rates when we're forced to but bonds uh again we keep to press we keep pressing into highs here uh day over day we keep heading higher uh, now that we're above the 132 to 133 area i do think right We've got a little more room to the upside, and then we're going to be looking for this area to be supportive on pullbacks, uh, which does suggest that the market is a little fearful right now of maybe, you know, a broader, not necessarily financial contagion, but certainly I think, you know, um, and, you know, a need for the, the Fed to slow down its interest rate cycle. Um, I'm finding it harder every day to see where that next financial contagion will come from if it hasn't popped already is kind of my my thing. It's like every day that something doesn't happen when people are, when, every day you don't smell smoke or see fire when people are screaming for fire, right? Uh, it makes me a little more weary of it. it does it, I still, of course, am aware that things can happen overnight and Monday morning we might come in and a whole another bank's collapsed, right? I mean, that's how quickly... Uh, you know, Lehman and, and Bear Stearns and others in the past just, you know, fall apart. Um, it, that's much how, that, that, that's how these things, you know, typically occur. So S&P 500, though, doesn't seem to be too necessarily worried about, uh, and our stock markets don't seem too worried about, you know, financial crises or recessions. Yeah, we are, and, and I mean that just because I think this, this fight over the 4,000 area in the S&P is kind of indicative of that. Below 4,000, we're fearful. We're in recession mode. Above 4,000 right now, uh, the market's saying or signaling, uh, "Hey, um, I think we need to be more forward-thinking and realize we're going to, you know, this too shall pass." Right? Like, was it as bad as the last one? No. Was it as bad as the, you know, housing and financial collapse in 2008-9? No. Uh, are banks as tight overall as then? No. Uh, the smaller regional banks might be, but some of the bigger banks are so big they're you know, pumped those two big to fail banks with so much cash uh, reserves that, I mean, this is why we're having an inflation problem now, right? Like the Federal Reserve policy is, is balancing, can we give banks enough cash to use and get in the system? 
or does that drive prices up too much and create too much inflation, right? But we have to give them cash to help them, you know, overcome these debt crunches that necessarily happen. But then at the same time, right, um, you end up causing inflation inadvertently, or in theory you do. They won't admit to it, right? But, I mean, come on, anyone who's taken economics 101 should be able to piece, you know, together how that is. Now, that's the unfortunate reality is that we have policies that are being, um, for lack of a better term, bastardized by, I believe, by political motives that no one's willing to admit, um, but they're there. Uh, I mean, but then again, that's government for you. I mean, if you think anything in government is happening without political motivation, <laughs> uh, I mean, ignorance is bliss. Uh, <laughs> so 4,100, we can't even break below in the near term for the S&P. We're breaking out above that long-term or that downward sloping trend line that really started the last, you know, pullback here and, and uh, fear uh, recessionary pullback. I mean, everyone wants to talk about recession in the S&P, but no one wants to talk about the, or, or in this in the market, in the economy, no one wants to talk about the fact that we kind of already pulled back in the market. We already fell 1,300 points off the highs, and you know, and the recession in theory, if it, you know, the lows in the market were in October of last year, fast forward two quarters ahead of that, that's when you start to see the actual fast, the actual economic indicators for recession hit. So my guess is starting with this Friday's report and going forward for probably the next quarter, you're going to see those recessionary type, type numbers start to hit. You're going to see the Fed start to do the things that they may need to do slow down. Uh, and I don't know anything any of the wiser. I'm just going off of the fact that the S&P and the stock market bottom, and statistically speaking, if a recession is occurring and a bottom in the market happens, uh, it's usually two to three quarters before uh, those recessionary numbers pop up in, you know, in, in, on, as news headlines. Um, because the market is forward thinking, and these are financial futures. Um, it's in the name, people. <laughs> no, anyway, jokes aside, that doesn't mean we can't revisit 3,900. We've been in this range. We've been talking about this range. There's plenty of trend lines on both sides. But this major one that we've been breaking above, I think, is the tail that we need to be you know, addressing. We broke above it. We came back down. We tested it as, as support. And it, it has created, in my opinion, kind of a new trend line. There's some other trend lines here against the lows that you could, you know, talked about, uh, maybe have, uh, have, having held here. Uh, but now I think we're starting to establish a reason to think that if the market keeps buying the dips, we will push through 4,200 uh, in some time frame. And, and in the near term, it might be another move to 4,300 before we kind of fall back down. But at that point now, I think we have reestablished a low. We're now pushing up towards, you know, and doing more damage to the short side than the longs, are, you know, or are, are than than uh, the longs are pro producing more progress higher than the shorts were able to produce lower. And you, you, you really have a market that has taken, you know, two steps forward since the COVID lows, one step back in a big recessionary period, and now we can take two steps forward again. And if that's the case, you know, my upside objectives from a swing at 3,500, which are not going to be hit in any near time frame, we're talking maybe a few years out here, but 5,400 and 6,400 could be on the table if you know the up and down in the long term swing you know occurs and again you have to go back and check some of my older videos i put them out and specifically on sp and the longer term and a look at you know a video that i you know i deemed uh, you know millennials black monday where we look back to covid the sell off we had and how we parallels very very well uh, you know black money in the 1980s uh, and then the subsequent price action in the market thereafter leading into one of the biggest bull runs in history seems to be repeating itself in my you know, humble opinion here. But, okay, we'll see. Um, you know, I know how the market, stock market can get there with the inflationary economy we have and the money that's in the system. So if you stop believing all hell is going to break loose and the financial world is going to collapse because I just don't see it, uh, you know, inflate away everything, uh, that means the S&P is going higher. Whether or not you think, you know, what you believe, it's just prices need to inflate and stock market prices are, are one of those things that will catch some of that uh, because risk and yield will be chased everywhere. All right. That's uh, all of our macro stuff, which took up half of, you know, 20, first 20 minutes of, of, of our time. Uh, so let's get into kind of the, 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 the nitty gritty of how this is affecting some of our, you know, uh, row crops and other agricultural products now, right? Um, 
Obviously, going back to crude real quick, the strength in crude is great to see. I think, I think you know, our veg oils uh, and our biofuel, you know, corn included in this, uh, everything connected to that should it should remain better bid um, because I don't really, personally, I don't see crude coming back down the way we close this week. I think we're, we're on our way back up to 90, maybe even, uh, you know, 100 to follow. But the point being is I think we, the next $10 in crude might be higher uh, before we come back down to fill this gap eventually. But um, needless to say, next week we'll prove that if we see a gap fill, things might remain, uh, you know, trapped below some levels and in a range for time being. And it could end up being, you know, a game of, you know, the U.S. Re replenishing its SPR, which puts in a basin in the, in the, in the crude, versus, you know, the, the rest of the world, OPEC, doing cuts and dumping and, and, and oil on the market and what have you. So we'll see. But that is certainly, you know, seeing crude back above 80 is helping, I think, uh, markets like corn and beans and, our, and more importantly should start to help uh, our other veg oils out a little bit more. And I think it did initially, but now, you know, the last week or so, we've seen us walk back on price action, right? We, we generally, you know, saw this week kind of end on a little bit of a softer note uh, for our row crops. And that wasn't, you know, necessarily a, um, wasn't necessarily what we wanted, right? I mean, uh, certainly if right, you were a row crop producer, I mean, I can understand, uh, you know, a cattleman and other people with different opinions on where they want uh, corn and bean prices to go. Uh, but generally speaking, right, um, um, we seem to be in a bull market. So there's a bit of a bias to that uh, opinion. May beans, 14 and 92 and a half down 18 and a half cents. Um, you know, on the day, uh, it was down considerably more. And you're thinking, well, Dan, how can you say bullish? That was a big break. Well, it was, but the more I reflect on May beans, the more I, you know, I see the capitulation for what it is. Um, I see a market really now, I think, creating kind of an upward sloping diagonal or like, you know, triangle against this 1550 area, which just makes me more bullish on a move above 1550, you know, to 1600 and above. Um, in the near term, though, you know, we, we, we came up in oversold bought conditions. Uh, the last week, right, we saw markets trade down to 1400 and all the way back up, um, which was a very quick kind of capitulating move on a stop run below 1480. You know, the, the last three months of price action through January, we were holding 1480 as support. We broke below it. We rallied back above it quickly. Got back above that 18 day moving average and now we've come back down to test the 18 day moving average as support the 200 day moving average was basically tested at 1455 to have no support but we're back above it we closed today right at or just above the 100 day moving average at 1490 uh, you know 293 and the 55 day moving average up at 1503 um i mean this was a market hurrying up trying to get back above those levels and this whole slide for the last month feels a lot like a gotcha one of the dirtiest little moves in soybeans before it goes higher. Um, this is, of course, assuming we stay above that 18-day moving average of 1480, and right this whole 1480 supportive, you know, area that we oh, there we go that we generally broke below and, and only have you know this very quick week and a half or you know of price action below. Uh, as long as we stay above that. I think we're just putting pressure back on these highs, and uh, that was just a, um, I don't know, a hunt or lots of, you know, fun trading going into our reports, you know, into that quarterly grain stock and acreage report, which, by the way, was a good reason to reverse here, given how the trade was missed it, right? The trade was bearish on the beans against those stocks, thinking we'd add to them. Uh, it was bearish against uh, on the acres, thinking we'd add to them. And then the USDA came out here and said, nope, gotcha. Uh, and we're right back up, right? Uh, so, yeah, now that we're back above 1480 and holding it again as support, I think that so long as we generally stay above 1480 or, you know, the lows of today and certainly above 1479, I think we could, um, I think we could continue higher here and um, be testing back towards the high end of the range in the near term, but I don't know, we'll see. Uh, no V beans. Uh, you know, unfortunately, not as bullish. Um, we saw that, you know, bounce back here over the same period, but 
look, we we got back above the 18-day moving average, right? Uh, we we failed to even get to the 55-day, 200-day, or 100-day, and we basically have rolled back over where this old, you know, that 14, the equivalent of that 1480 area in May beans is that we got back above, and now we might be holding a support again. Novi beans is holding that same line in the sand, like the support that we held from you know January through today, right, or through early March, it was a 1340 area, right? That's now resistance in Novi Beans. That's not a good look for new crop. But then again, you have a day like today where we're down 18 cents in the, in the front months, down only six in the, and the, in the, in the back months. Um, you have to realize that there's also then some unwinding going on um, or, you know, some trading in the actual, you know, new crop, whole crop spread here. Uh, you look at that May, uh, May, November spread, and you can see in a day like today how, uh, how we're just needing to, Basically, come off testing two dollars over in the May November spread on April seventh. That just seems way too inverted for this trader's taste, um, right? For right now, but that's the spread market for you. Um, but if you were to, you know, look at a chart, and I look at these old crop, new crop spreads as kind of a barometer for you know, a market emotional state or whatever, this is a pretty overwhelmingly optimistic state. Um, and testing $2 over, right, going to a high yesterday of two, oh, come on, uh, there we go, two, like 208, right, and then settling today at $1.84, you know, 20 some odd cents off the highs in that and getting bear spread, that's um, that's pretty indicative of, of some, I think, you know, profit taking in the spread alone, right? Or unwinding the spread. Uh, if it wants to come back towards trend line, right? We still have another 10 to 20 cents down towards, you know, 178, which is the 18 day moving average, 55 days down around 155 on this thing. I mean, this is a market that's, you know, it's a spread that's trending. So why not use trending indicators on it now, right? Spreads aren't always doing that, but this is the year it is. Um, and we're unwinding from an overbought condition on the daily RSI. So I still can't weigh out, you know, a really big unwind down towards the 200-day moving average, which would take us down to a dollar over. Uh, that would probably happen, you know, into the end of life for May, uh, if there was a reason. Um, but, but, you know, that's where, um, yeah, that's where you got to ask yourselves: um, Is this the? Is it not the right time to right start thinking about protection, right? Instead of, um, you know, kind of being overwhelmingly bullish um, if things are starting to go into kind of a bear spread attitude. Um, certainly, we, this market can unwind if, you know, Novi Beans were to rally further, farther, faster than uh, than July. But, like, in what world does that make sense when you have, like, you know, the tightest ending stocks in old crop beans we've had in how long and, and exports that are generally not as exciting as we uh, were hoping, right? Uh, that just doesn't make sense to me. If you saw exports, right, or, I mean, there would have to be new crop exports, right, that uh, were gangbusters, right? Okay, it would make sense to me to see us unwind and bear spread in new crop, old crop spreads in a bullish market. But um, to be very bullish beans here, you almost have to accept that we are going to maybe 220, 240, 250 over in the May, July bean spread, which... Uh, or may, uh, excuse me, may Novi bean spread, which is, which is incredibly, incredibly wide. Um, so it's kind of hard to, hard to do that, right? Um, and that's, a, again, that's all assuming that, you know, November would lag. Because, again, the this, this spread could go sideways here at 184 uh, from now until eternity if <laughs> Novi beans trades on par with, you know, May beans, but... I think we're. I think you're all getting where I'm going with this, right? Um, some of these things are starting to hit, you know, more ex the the more extreme side of statistical statistical sentiment on things, right? Um, so we'll see. But they don't call these old crop, new crop spreads the widow makers for, you know, any old reason, right? Um, you can see how a spread that you think would be you know, people think of spreads as being tamer. No, this one's moving around as much as an underlying contract on a day like today. So it's down 11 cents on the day alone. Uh, so more volatile than corn for sure. Um, all right. So that's just, you know, one little look into my thoughts on the beans. It, you know, I'm not trying to turn into 
you know, and, and spook the bulls too much there. But taking a look at the smaller time frame, right, I think this 1480 area is very important in the near term. We had a very, very, very rapid, you know, incline in the soybeans. We had this upward sloping trend line against the lows on the four hour chart that yesterday gave way. I mean, we came down and we tested it. We got a reaction up to highs of the day. We came back down and then we broke below that trend line and have had a, you know, 30 cent slide thereafter in one day's worth of, you know, 24 hour period, basically. It's a little spooky, right? Um, right back down into the 1480 support. It's the support from before. It was the area that capitulated below. And arguably, you're kind of making this insanely, uh, you know, this insanely deep diving inverted head and shoulders with kind of a whole shoulder pattern at the 1480 with a giant upside down neckline up at 1550, right? Uh, but there's a lot more that needs to, you know, come to fruition for that. So the move down off of highs, breaks, capitulates below 1480. We come back up. We trade this very aggressive trend line. There's some other trend lines here that are all gone now. Uh, I am worried that this is a very, very rapid retest of this other upward sloping trend line against the highs um, that is now um, finding resistance. We're kind of fighting above it, now back below it. Um, I'm actually going to remove it from the chart for the time being because I just want to concentrate on what's going on on the levels that we've clearly been identifying. Uh, the 150 or the 1549 to 1550 area, that's obviously something of you know, interesting note now. I mean, clearly it, you know, clearly the market doesn't want to get above there for some reason, right? But now I feel like this other old support is back at it and I am willing to, you know, watch it into next week to see if uh, it continues to hold and then be positioned against it, right? Getting long again. Um, maybe we end up with a new trend line, who knows, you know, uh, getting long again for a move back higher. Um, I'm just, you know, one day down off that high does not a reversal in the, in the you know, whole uptrend to necessarily make just yet, but certainly continuation through these lows, man, there's not much in the, in the works until 1469 again. And then again, you know, below that, I think the market has proven to us time and time again that there's really nothing below 1480, right? Like, look what it did, did last time. So, uh, maybe even you think about, you know, owning the 1480 puts. Um, with stops at 1480 uh, for a long future. Um, that way you get taken out, you let the put ride all the way down. Uh, if not above, you got the put as protection as a stop, <laughs> uh, you know, so to speak, or, or to some effect. I don't know. But I'm just dreaming up a way of, hey, how do I make, you know, the next 80 cents in beans up or down um, going along a future with a put and then kind of making a decision in this 1480, 1470 area, maybe getting out of the future and letting the put ride could be a way of trading in or out and having, you know, your tag teaming onto a position within within your account. Um, we'll see. Got to get a few more markets here to get through and not much time to get through them. So maybe or corn. May corn, 643 and a half last into the end of the day in a close, uh, right back into the 18 day moving average now as support. Make a case for an upward sloping trend line uh, coming in really close to you know yesterday's low. We then break below it today. We'll see. Uh, we'll look at that on like the 15, um, on the smaller time frame chart here uh, and the four hour chart here in a minute. Uh, but man, we came right back up into that 650, 657, 660 area where the 200 day moving averages have just, or the 200 day, 55 day and 100 day moving average have been clustered together and have offered resistance. Um, this old upward sloping trend line, uh, that was, you know, kind of our support that we broke below. We've come back up to test those resistance. Downward sloping trend lines against the highs seem to still be holding if you, you know, continue them through here. Uh, the 650 area. So, you know, I can't deny that, you know, below today's low, below this 18 day moving average, you know, why don't we open back down, you know, 6.10 to $6 and, you know, just be kind of in the sideways range still for corn. I mean, heck, we found, you know, 2.3 million acres, right? Why not? <laughs> Jokes aside, right? Um, and those acres being intended plantings, you know, that you can, you can't really hang your hat on just yet, right? 
Um, but there is still, what my point is, is that like there's still room in this range in both directions for it to go. I mean, we could still trade up to 680, we could still trade down to 620, and still really not have gone anywhere in the long grand scheme of things for May corn. Um, so dialing down, coming out of an overbought condition, we have pulled back now into the 18-day moving average. Okay, dialing down to the four-hour chart, do we see any, you know, reason, and there's a lot of lines here, uh, for the market to give us a trend indication or an area. Well, we identified the sideways price action months ago when we did the double 618 line break, 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 right? We've been consolidating around those levels. Uh, I would love to take them off the chart, but they're purple for a reason because you can't kind of just try to see through them or ignore them for a minute. You have the downward sloping trend lines against the highs. You see that coming in around 770, maybe one up through the lows. That's cool. There was a more aggressive channel, an upward sloping trend line from the 606 figure you know, through the 623 figure, we've been tracking in the, in the strategy of the day or week. Uh, we broke below that trend line here recently. We've actually held the 50% short from highs to the lows right around there, right? Held that move. It went down to its target. That target broke the break of the trunk. So there is a technical short that's trying to get in here and uh, reverse the market and the trend lower, in my opinion. However, to uh, next in the series longs, one here at 645, as well as the next down there at 637. Oh, that's the full 50%, you know, swing from low to high here. Uh, that's the 50% long right there. Um, seemed like we're in striking range of that. So it's like into next week. I almost think we should go to 637 to 630 just to like clean up my technicals or like give me a reason to capitulate back into a trade, right? Um, so to speak, if you're flat corn or whatever, because I did not like the fact that we went below 646 today. Um, that was kind of my line in the sand in the near term, right? This up with some trend line now that we've gone down. You know, I, my comments before would be what would stop us from sliding back down? Well, again, what would stop us from going to this halfway back? So I'm looking for that. I'm interested in just below the 640 area, you know, 637. And down there, you know, I think you know, looking at put options above the highs here of the month at 670 are going to get interested or our call options will get interesting. Um, but, you know, in terms of protection to the downside, I think below the lows here at 606 and below $6, you really have to consider, you know, how far down the rabbit hole could corn go. Uh, but bull markets don't close gaps. And, you know, we've left that one open since last August here for the May corn. Um, but if we do head lower, ooh, Boy, could that be a downside gap that we'll be talking about at some point in time. Um, I guess I should have covered these with, I mean, just real quickly with uh, our beans, but uh, bean oil, meal was kind of the leader today, uh, getting a nice little bounce back up to try to close back by the 100-day moving average at, six, uh, at 453. 18 day moving average of 460 is where I need to see it get back above to get a little more bullish on this chart. I can make a case for a big 50% pullback happening. However, after that, the rally back up into the 18 day moving average and the 55 day moving average that we saw in the meal, uh, in the May meal, that made me a little more bearish and kind of rolled over. And I'm like, uh oh, are we going down to the 420 to 400 area, you know, back into that old, old high and back into the upward sloping trend line support? I think that 200 day moving average at 425, I'm interested in being a buyer if it were to go down there. But I don't know if it's getting down there anymore, right? Uh, after price action a day like today and what clearly looked like, you know, first attempt to break above the moving average. Now I think we're coming up for the move above it. Uh, and then there's going to be some oscillation in price action above it. We'll see. But I'm also thinking we need to widen out those crush margins, right? Crush margins going below five-year averages here in the last week, last few days. Bean oil and bean meal are just too low relative to soybean. So if soybeans go down, um, these things can sit still. But uh, generally speaking, on a day where beans were down, seeing meal up, well, I'll tell you where the crush margins were, were trying to improve today. Uh, it was in that meal. Oil down uh, 69 cents on the day, but was generally trying to get a nice reaction off of its lows. Uh, there's a 50% long here from 51.25 up to highs. Uh, we pulled back into that 54 area. Uh, we're trying to break above that 18-day moving average and kind of fell back below. This 5380 area, though, has been, you know, majorly supportive here in the past. Kind of a big three waves down, maybe an old triangle with a big push lower. Uh, I think this 50, I think we're basically trying to find a larger bottom. But again, back up into this old trend line, old support, uh, and up into the old range above 58. It's going to be uh, interesting to watch. So the 55-day moving average, if we go back up into it, 
it's probably going to be pretty indicative, in my opinion, of, of direction, or at least of the swing at this point, the, the prevailing trend. Uh, we're going to continue to keep an eye on that. Uh, palm oil here into the end of the day had, uh, you know, closed a little bit lower, but generally speaking, we've seen, you know, a reversal back higher in palm oil back inside the range between 30, you know, 700 and 4,400. We're trying to climb her back above all of our moving averages, which, you know, being range bound here for the last over 200 days, you can see how we're kind of building up into this area. Uh, but I do think, you know, again, push back up to 4,100, take a look higher. And uh, canola oil, seeing a similar bounce. Uh, but again, finding this old, you know, support around 780 uh, now is resistance on the way back up. But very, very, very optimistic on the move back above in canola. The 18-day moving average, we pull back to hold it as support. And today we found a rally back up, you know, towards highs. Um, this looks pretty good. And now we'll move towards the 55 and 100-day moving averages, which I, in my opinion, reverse the trend, put us back into the old uh, range and really break through trendline resistances. And a lot of the reasons and, you know, technical reasons that this downtrend, you know, kind of continued lower. So keeping an eye out uh, there. In wheat markets, Chicago wheat, uh, maybe a little bit of an inverted head and shoulders pattern here forming, but that means in the early next week, we could see another 15 cents lower. Um, that's where I'm thinking about maybe, you know, going and looking at some weekly call options through the end of next week or the week after. Uh, trying to work orders to buy, you know, 690, 685 calls. Uh, for half price, you know, um, looking to get things when they dip, if there is an early dip, um, assuming that we, you know, do kind of hold on to supportive lows and then, you know, find our way back up to highs. It's tough because the old range we were in for, uh, from December through March, we broke below and now we seem to be, you know, kind of for, for, forming its own range down here. Uh, but I'm optimistic if we can get back above, you know, the 18 day moving average, move towards 720 still on the table. I just feel we are way too short in the funds for wheat. I don't see the fundamental rationale for how much we have sold off and how far below the Ukrainian crisis lows we've gone, even though I know that, okay, 1250 wheat might be a little overdone, $10 Chicago wheat might be overdone, but 675 Chicago wheat when 644 corn is trading and a 31 cent differential there, that doesn't make uh, or sit well or make sense to me. Why is Chicago wheat also at a $2, you know, discount to the KC wheat? That doesn't make sense to me. I think funds are in here. They've gotten way too short. We've been unable to track that fund position due to, to uh, the CFTC kind of being behind on those data point releases. Um, at some point, somebody I think is going to get caught way too short the wheat. And I, I don't know what's the headlines going to be, but I don't know. I, don't, I would not have been wanting to be, sh you know, too short going into a long weekend like this. Uh, when we are really in the crux of weather markets. Uh, we shall see, so shouldn't we? Uh, and to that point, KC wheat holding on far better, breaking above its trend line resistances, above its 100-day, 55-day, and 18-day moving average, and arguably holding all of those levels, including that downward sloping trend line now as support. I'm bullish to KC wheat still. The KC wheat Chicago spread has continued to reflect the reason why we are bullish to KC wheat relative to the Chicago, even though we know this spread at some point could unwind uh, because, hey, being $1.50 over in the July on July and $1.90 over on the, 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 the May on May is just remarkable. I mean, we were trading these spreads back when we were 50 and 60 cents over. And we are multitudes and, and we've gone way further than anything I thought these things would go, right? Um, so, okay. Cool. Uh, we had the right <laughs> we had the right scenario and narrative behind the strength in wheat and where it was coming from and tracking it and the one place you track it right in KC wheat versus Chicago. But uh, and it's been all regardless of the directional trend of prevailing wheat, right? But if KC wheat is holding on to lows and turning more bullish, Chicago wheat can't really go down much lower. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me <laughs> anymore. Uh, you know. It's starting to look like a value buy down here, just relative to the price of corn, relative to the price of KC wheat, all these things. So, you know, I don't know. It's right. But hey, this is where a great example of markets can remain irrational longer than we can remain liquid as traders, right? You are not big enough to, uh, to, to survive that kind of move in the wheat. And the wheat, Chicago wheat, has virtually, I think, hit a point of like insanity when it comes to the short. Uh, that, it, that, that must be built up in this market, holding it down. But I don't know. What do I know? I'm just a little, you know, I'm just a lowly broker here in Chicago. <laughs> um, 
right? Um, but an amazing, right, an amazing, uh, amazing printout. Anyway, 200 day moving average is the resistance now for that KC uh, wheat. Let's take a look at those in the short term and uh, finish out with our cattle and hogs real quick and be done with the week and everybody can go on to a long weekend. So KC, uh, we here in the near term, uh, we kind of broke below old trend line resistance uh, support there now is resistance. Uh, you know, full 50% retracement at 835, I think would be a gift. Uh, it's at this point that I think we're, you know, kind of just right now um, holding this old 840 to 850 area as, you know, the inflections on the old highs and old low. Uh, we went up, we're testing a support. This old trend line that we've broken up above, we're testing a support. And a good reason why I think 902 to 920, uh, 910 to 920 is on the table uh, next. Uh, here going forward, we can also find some uh, some other extended poles. We'll get into those at some other day. Uh, but generally speaking, if you were to draw a you know some kind of channel here, uh, maybe from highs to highs or whatever, and pull it down to lows, uh, you can see here how you know you can make an argument that we're kind of channeling higher at this point in the KC wheat, and channel resistance would be 920 to 925. Okay, um, Chicago wheat. Just almost looks the opposite, but again, this almost inverted head and shoulders pattern. I hated this upward sloping trend line that we broke below. Uh, it was something I was worried about because now that looks like we broke below it and came up to it as now resistance, uh, and the market's kind of rolling back over. Uh, early next week, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see another test down to 660, and that's where I'm like, okay, maybe in Chicago wheat the play is go pick some call options you like and try to buy them for half price or something, you know, if there's a dip. Uh, but if we do kind of formulate more of a low here, I need to see us back about six ninety, seven dollars and then, you know, I'll get bullish again for moves to seven twenty, a break maybe above these upper sloping trend lines at seven thirty, and now we're talking eight dollars and nine dollars Chicago wheat. And I think rather quickly, if and when it happens, right? But boy, this downward this downtrend just does not seem to uh, the book bears just do not seem to uh, want to give things up uh, here at this moment. All right, and in cattle, all I have to say is I'm uh, surprised how bullish it's gotten. It's a gap up. Watch out. Bull markets don't cl close gaps. But if we do start off next week coming back down and closing that gap, this is a great reason to form a top, right? But I think there's going to be a little bit more of a blow off. Not much I can say in terms of how much higher it can go. Feeder cattle, though, not breaking out with the live cattle through their highs is my cause for concern, you know, for the market to continue higher. Uh, you know, feeders are usually the leaders here. Cattle, live cattle have now... Uh, you know, gone up uh, kind of without them a little bit here into new highs. Doesn't mean it can't next week, but I'm a little more concerned than not. So that wraps today, everybody. Uh, we'll see where cattle are next week. It's so strong. There's not much to do. It's just kind of hurry, sit back and wait. Um, certainly great levels to start locking in if you can for those cattlemen that don't have, uh, um, that haven't maybe done anything uh, here yet this year. Um, but all that being said, you can always reach me over here at Zayner at 312-277-0010. Um, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter or shoot me an email at Zayner, dhussey at zayner.com. Always looking to, uh, this time of year in particular, talking to uh, new uh, potential and uh, looking to bring new clients on board because we are at the start you know, of a new marketing year. Uh, and it is the best time, if any, to have those discussions about risk management uh, what you've got left over, what we can help you with in terms of pricing through this next year, and how to best manage the commodity risk that you wake up with every day. Have a great day, everybody, and we'll be back with you as price action.